everything lost will be renewed Long ago in the garden it was to be Now a dream fulfilled in you and me whoa, 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 whoa. Hey, 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 welcome back Today is going to be exciting I'm going to be talking about some crazy ideas that I've been hearing from people who I would not expect to be saying such, honestly, just crazy things. They seem to be people who have an experience with God and and seem to be stable, and and they are. I'm not trying to mock anybody or put anything down, but ideas still have a way of getting into us. And so this idea that's been on my mind has been just honestly blowing me away how many people will fall prey to such a silly thing, but yet it becomes a real big battle. And so I'm, I'm excited. This is going to be some simple truth and some fun stuff to go through. And I'm going to try to keep it funny, but also it's, it's very serious and real as well. But just when you recognize the silliness of how Satan comes in sometimes and steals reality, steals things from us, he wants to find a way just to remove some of the simple basic things and make it complicated, making us feel like that unless we are just so careful and intense that, that God's not going to be happy. He's not going to be pleased with us. So the topic that I have on my mind is about, I have on my mind is about worshiping. There's this fear. There's this idea that somehow in our process of worshiping God, that at church, that we sing songs, that as we um, listen to music that is worshipful, that somehow that you might be worshiping Satan instead of God by accident, just because some of the things that are in those songs might not be exactly right. They might not be scriptures. They're actually a movement. There's different people who believe that the songs we sing should only, only include exact quotes from the Bible. I don't know why that everybody feels that way. I don't have a problem with, with singing scriptures. I think singing scriptures is a good thing. It's a powerful thing even. And I love some of those songs, but the people who wrote the songs in the Bible, they were just trying to enter into the presence of God and they were writing things that were true, that were revealed by the spirit of God. Actually, I'll just get into that real fast. When the people of God began to worship and David dedicated people to worship 24 seven, and these people lived a dedicated life to worship. One th- one of the things that happened was that not only do we have the power of God begin to manifest and the nation have the spirit of God present. And this is a beautiful thing. This is something that is the people of God need to get a hold of and establish the movement of God to towards worship is a powerful, powerful thing. And we don't need to be afraid of it, but the kingdom of God, when this was established, those people, those men who were worshiping God in spirit and in truth and dedicating their life to it, they began to do something. They began to get into the presence of God, hear from his voice and the things that they wrote are now in the Bible. They are our scriptures. So what happened is these people, as they worship, they got so close to God that they began to write the very words of God. That is something that is so near and dear to my heart. I want worship to be so prophetic, so filled with the anointing of the spirit of God that as we, as we go through it, we receive from God so that the words we are singing are the words of God. And those things are spoken. They are alive and they make us intimate with God, but they give us vision and purpose, understanding. They teach us So that's one of the things that worship is really about. But this idea that we could accidentally, in our heart, when we are loving God, we could accidentally, because we are singing songs that we haven't thought through or that somebody else wrote, and there's, and I'm not saying that all songs are good. I'm not, that's not what my point is. There are songs that are just poorly written. There are songs that are not anointed. There are songs that are probably produced just to make money, but I don't, I don't really worry about that type of thing. I'm not so concerned about that because I know that if I'm worshiping in spirit and in truth, if my heart is towards God, then it really doesn't matter what somebody else brings to the table because I'm going to be connecting with God. I'm going to be declaring what I know about him, what he's worthy of, what, who he is to me. And as I get close to him, I'm, I'm not concerned with this. I'm not living this life of being afraid that I'm going to worship Satan somehow because I said a line that isn't doctrinally true. And I'll come back to that. But when you are worshiping, one of the simple things about worship is that you want to, we get, it's easy to lose this, very easy to lose sight of what 
It really is. And so I've just been boiling it down to this statement lately that worship is very, very basically just, I love Jesus, how about you? Because that's what we're doing. We're joining together. Worship is not about me by myself. And I know that's actually something that I think we as in groups need to understand that sometimes it's not just about how I want to express my worship. Yes, each one of us are going to express it in a unique way and be able to show the glory of God in a unique way. But there's also about unity. When we come together, we are unifying together. And there's a, there's a power. There's an anointing. There's a presence of God, and there's a, the voice of God that can come through his people and into his people as we unite together. And so, I love Jesus, how about you, is, a, is a, just a simple phrase that I've come up with, because it is that simple. Now, it's not that we just stay focused on, on the simple and never go anywhere deeper, but I don't want to lose sight of that. I don't want to make it so complicated that I'm sitting there trying to ascertain some way of singing some song, especially songs that are really complicated lyrically. Yes, sometimes those are good. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to judge any songs. I think they all have a place. They have a purpose. And, and the person writing them can have anointing in in their heart towards what they're seeing, what they're believing, um, for what God is saying as they're reading the scripture, as they're inspired by the things of God. But when it comes to worship, we don't want to get so caught up in something that we think that it has to be complicated because it it starts from that simple basic of the expression of how much that we really do. And it's not a worked up thing. It's, it's, you stir it, you go deep into yourself and you find out you, you examine your heart because that's what worshiping in truth is really about. And on many levels is understanding where your heart is being honest with your heart. And so if you want to worship him, make sure that that's where you're coming from, that you really are in that place of wanting to give him glory and honor in a real thing, examine your heart, stir it up, find the the memories of what he really means, what he says and what he has done in your life. That is, you know, in that there's, there's, you know, there's no fear in love. When you're in love with God, you shouldn't be afraid that you're going to mess up because you understand a little bit more than, Oh, this, this, powerful God. And I'm just, I'm just a man. And what did I do? Did I mess up? He's going to strike me dead. That's, that is paganism. That's not the heart of God. That's not the way God revealed himself in scriptures. So there's a fear that somehow we can mess up. You know, I don't understand how you can mess up when we worship God. I mean, there's not really any precedent of anybody that I know of worshiping God and failing. Now, Obviously, there are people who, in that place of being afraid of God, not necessarily knowing God, not necessarily understanding who God is or why he does the things that he does, yes, we create religious, organized things that that are um, keeping us from entering into that simple relationship and that place of trust that we can express our love and our affection, our desire for God in purity. Yes, those things happen. That gets broken up by the deceit. And that's that's one of the things that Satan is always trying to do. He's always trying to separate us from that intimacy in every way that he can. Anytime that he can deceive us, anytime that he can come up with a way that breaks down that communication, that connection with God, he's going to come in. And that comes... In every form, at every stage of our development, it never goes away. Satan wants to find some way to undermine it. This is just another one of those things where he's making us afraid. He's making us afraid that that our worship could somehow be dishonoring to God or that we're going to unleash lies. And, I, you know, I hear about some of the different songs and... Um, I'll just mention one of them. You know, people, people get so concerned. I heard a song by um, David Crowder. And that song that David Crowder wrote is very simple and it's um, called God Really Loves Us. And it says, um, hallelujah, um, God really loves us. God really loves us. Uh, uh, worship, oh my soul. And I'm probably not getting all the lyrics right at this moment. But I had I heard people saying, oh, why are we worshiping my soul? I mean, just taking 
not even understanding the English language. I, I mean, I've, I've seen so many different things like this. And I, I'm not trying to mock anybody who's actually concerned and really trying to figure out things and understand what God says and, and do things in a better and more full way. I'm not, like I said, I'm not mocking anybody in that regard. But the these fear based, you can come up with all different reasons not to do something. When God says do something, you can come up with all the different things about how failed you are, how bad we are, how all the different things. But God just says do it. And worshiping God is not something to be afraid of because it is the most real, it is the most intimate thing that we can experience. And when you are in love with somebody, when somebody is in love with you, and that's what we have to remember, God loves us. God is love. And so when we come to him, to express an affection towards him, just to to remember, to remind each other, to unite in declaring the praises of our God. There's nothing to be afraid of because, yes, we might all have different ideas. We might all have, have understanding that is different, that is limited, that is not complete, and we might express things or say things that are not even the perfect picture of who our God is. Is that going to harm anything? No. Because that's part of the process. When a child thinks about their parents, they don't understand everything about who their parents are. They just love them. They appreciate them, especially if they're good kids. But there's, they look up to them. There's not this thing that they have to understand everything perfectly in order to be a good kid. Well, to be a good kid to our God, to love him, it's not about where our level is of understanding has come to. Our doctrinal understanding is not really what it's about. There are so many things that that God is after that have nothing to do with that. And that process of understanding grows. And yes, our worship can come into more alignment. And that's where prophetic is about. When you are speaking and singing songs that are prophetic, they are anointed with the power of God. The glory of God comes into those moments, especially when they're spontaneous, because then they're actually being sung in the moment by the power of God in our life, by by getting close to him, by expressing things that we're seeing right then as we're thinking about him, as we're focusing on him, and the spirit of God begins to move, those words become alive. And so we're expressing the prophetic, the, just again, just to explain it, if, some, if you're not familiar with prophetic, prophecy is not about telling the future. Hardly ever is it about telling the future. It can be about what God's plans are for the future. It can be about that, but that's not the primary thing. But for some reason, it has become thought of that that's what prophecy is. Biblical prophecy is about hearing from God and speaking and knowing what the word of God for right now is. And that happened throughout the scriptures. The word of God would come to different ones, come through the prophets. It would come through different individuals being under the power of the spirit of God. And that's what we have to have. This is something that is vital to the church. You cannot have this through a planned, um, conformed message or idea that is 100% certain of everything that's going to happen at a given moment. Our services have to, re- have to be open. We have to have freedom. God wants to move in those moments. When, when we come to the Lord, each one, God will move on each one of us with different things. And so to close that down, when with the the controlling force of leadership, and this is not a message about leadership, but leaders have to understand and learn that that's their job to facilitate. It's not their job to stop it or clamp it down. It's their job to actually facilitate the move of God so that the Spirit of God can have his way and that the anointing of God can speak. And so the prophetic, the moment of what God has to say to his people that morning or that evening or whenever you're getting together, that's what he wants to do, and that's the job of leadership, not to stop that, but to facilitate that, to open that, to make that more accessible to people. This um, lie, this fear that is that we could somehow mess up, it's, it comes from a place that I believe Satan has designed um, this lie to keep believers from worshiping in spirit. Now, when you are in this place of worshiping, and you're always thinking about, oh, well, are those lyrics right? Is this song exactly right? Um, it it changes from a place in our spirit. We, we worship from our, our spirit, and this is the call of God. Um, but 
Satan, and it's not just this lie, but many different ways, he desires for us to worship from our minds, from our will, from our desire. And that, that's, th those are all things that we should do. We should absolutely give our minds and our desires to God. But from the Spirit, it's a way of connecting to God. We are connecting with God. That's how we get our life flow with the regeneration process. When we are forgiven of our sins, we are regenerated in our spirits to connect back to God, to have life flow. And so he gives us life, but we also flow with him. And when we're to worship God in our spirits, in the truth, in the reality of that relationship of that life in God, that is something that Satan wants to undermine and, and make more difficult or eliminate out of our life because that place creates such a power, such a anointing that transforms and breaks off strongholds. So worshiping in spirit is very, very important. But when we get to this place of thinking and having to examine everything or especially operating in fear, because that's not from the spirit of God, but operating in fear, we are examining and we're now thinking. We're using our minds to process all these lyrics. And I'm not against thinking, don't get me wrong. But that is not the same thing as worshiping from what we have this connection with God. But also, we are to cultivate this, to, to develop this, because it's not something that we just know how to do or understand day one. But worshiping in the spirit is something that's very, very important. It's very, very vital to begin to develop, but Satan wants us to keep it in the realm of just our thoughts, just our mind, just our will, just our emotions. And when he does that, he takes the power away because the power of God to move in our spirit and to have us connected with him. And I know this sounds a little bit metaphysical because, well, it is, it's talking about the spirit, but it's real. It's not something that is just, we think of it. It is actually a real thing that when you learn to develop and actually operate in your spirit to connect with God, you begin to, the, he, he then connects to our minds, connects to our will, connects to our emotions, and he begins to show us things. Now, I'm not against emotional responses. I'm 100% in favor of being emotional. When I feel my love for my spouse, I want to express that and I want to show it, I want to live it. Being emotional about the things that are real and true and good are 100% a beautiful thing. They will, they will strengthen that reality um, and not weaken it. But when we are in love with God, we're somehow afraid oftentimes. And we're told that that's being emotionally driven worship is, is not a good thing. Well, it's not a good thing if it's driven by emotion. But our emotions... Sh are and should be, and if you actually will focus your mind, your heart, and begin to worship from the Spirit, you will recognize that your emotions that you feel didn't come from just an outside stimulated thing. Well, sometimes that's okay too. I don't, like I said, I don't want to get off in, in trying to categorize and say it has to happen one way. There's many times that somebody or something reminds me of something that makes me happy, that, that is truth, that is real, something that I appreciate, something that I'm excited to be a part of. And it brings joy. And that emotional response is a good thing that I should, that I should absolutely continue to hold to the reality of that. And we see David doing this. He corrects when, when his emotions are wrong. He corrects them with new emotions, with the proper emotions. He connects with that. He says, why are you cast down? Why are you cast down? You're supposed to know who God is. You're supposed to recognize talking to himself, to his mind, to his emotions. Why are you so depressed? Why are you down? doesn't matter how miserable things are right now. You know who God is. And when you know who God is, your emotions need to be corrected to the joy, to the peace, to the satisfaction, to the desire for him, for the passion for him. So you correct it to those things. When we understand that, we're no longer afraid of emotional worship. We're not afraid of emotional times before God because we're actually correcting things. We're at, instead of being out of, out of place. I know people who who do just simply respond to other things. And so they're not cultivating it inside and they get caught up in, in the emotions of worship and that there's not a whole lot that it gets developed in that. And I get that. I understand that we need more than just a feeling more than just an excitement. That's, that's real. But 
Is there something wrong with feeling good about God? Is there something wrong with, with feeling the joy of God or being excited about the things of God and having an intense desire for God? Is there anything that can possibly be wrong about that? I have yet to find that. I find that the Bible continually talks good about it. It puts it in a good light. There's nothing wrong with it. There's no downside. There's no bad. There's no negative to those things. But if that's all there is, and you're not actually cultivating this connection with God in your spirit, then yes, that's a limited thing, and it will ultimately become lacking because you you don't have the other things. But the idea or the reaction, the fear that worshiping God um, with emotions and with the stirring of God in us is is a bad thing, is neglecting that altogether as well, and it's not cultivating because. It's not cultivating the spirit of God. You can't cultivate the spirit of God without emotions. I mean, there's just no way that you can actually have a connection to God and it not stir your thoughts and your desires about who God is because he's so good, he's so real, he's so powerful, he's so true. Your emotions will come in line with that. And there's no way that if you are worried and you're constantly focused on what the fear of what these words, the lyrics, the songs that we're singing, are they, do they have enough of the scriptures? Are they true enough for me to get, you know, you are focusing on the your thoughts instead of on cultivating the worship. And that is not healthy because you're going to be cutting off and being bound up by this fear. And fear is, as we know, it's not operating in faith. It's not having the faith of God. It's being concerned about something rather than going towards the truth. See, when you react to something you, to, rather than going towards what you know is true, you're already off track. Even if it's slightly, you should be following the truth instead of reacting to everything else that is not true. Does that make sense? When you follow the truth, the reality of who God is you can get closer to him. But when you react to something that's not true, you're, you're always going to be off track to some extent. And so reacting to something in fear does not bring about the power of God that he wants us to connect with, to have, the, like I said, the prophetic, the, the, the speaking, the, the, the intention of God to come alive in his people, to speak to his body and connect and show his affection, show his love that makes us one with him, makes us one together in unity and empowers his people to break down the walls, to break chains off of our hearts and off our minds. This is, these are the different, you keep using different things to describe what worship can be, but the message that I'm talking about today is, is really just to, I want to dispel this and I don't even want to be light, make it light, but it does. It just seems once you start breaking it down, that it's silly. The idea that you would not be in truth because the lyrics are off. There's another thought that I was ha having. You know, I, I get that we want songs that have ex that express the deepest, the the most clear, the most real truth that there is. I get that. I, I want lyrics that are true. But when he said to worship in spirit and in truth, that's not what he was actually talking about. He was talking about um, being honest. He was talking about being sincere truth that when we worship him in truth, it's about the, the sincerity, the level of what we really intend, what we really desire for him. So instead of us lying, instead of us just saying things, especially if the lyrics are true, what, well, they might be, they're just straight up scripture. They're truth. They're, they're the Bible. They're the power of God. They're the word of God. And so we can 100% be in agreement that there's no debate whether this is true. Well, that doesn't change the fact that your heart might not be sincere. You might be just singing those words. You might just be saying those words. You might just be thinking those words, but not having your heart in it, not being sincere, not being honest. So you wouldn't be worshiping God in truth. Now, you know, the actual doctrinal understanding, you know, if just because the lyrics are are spoken and they're doctrinally sound. Well, for one thing, doctrine is so debated. You go from to another church, they would not consider the same doctrines, the exact same thing. And I'm not trying to say that, well, all of everything's true and there's no truth in, in, in an ecumenical way. I'm not trying to say that at all. What I am trying to say is that God deals with us. He teaches us 
and we don't all have the full understanding. We don't ha all have yet complete understanding, and we are going to disagree. But does that mean that because we disagree that we can't worship God? Actually, I think we can worship God. That's one of the things that we can do in the middle of the process. When we still, still disagree on many things, we have different understanding or lack of understanding. In that lack, in that place where we differ, if we are actually um, coming together, worship is one of those things that is powerful. It, it supersedes those things. It doesn't make it meaningless. Obviously, um, God wants us to, to be unified in our, in our pursuit of him. And when we disagree on things, there's oftentimes we will pursue things um, that don't align with each other. And so I'm not, like I said, I'm not trying to get off in that side of the message. But the beauty of it is that in our incompleteness, in our process, worshiping God doesn't have to be less powerful. In fact, this is the beauty of worship is that you can have the brand new believer. You can have the most experienced believer. You can have the retired believer in late in life. You can have um, people who are on fire for God. You can have all these different people come together and we can unify in who God is, in, in what he means to us. We unify and come together and we begin to transcend our differences. We can actually come to more unity because when we respect the work of God, the hand of God, instead of judging and saying, now you're not really as close to God as I am. Well, maybe you're not, maybe you're closer. I don't know on that level. I don't have the power to see into your heart and understand those things. Even if you may misunderstand something, you may have something that you don't believe that, that I know to be true doesn't change the fact that your relationship with God is so very real. Maybe it is deeper. Maybe it's stronger, your connection with God. And so when we worship, I begin to see that. When we get into the presence of God, at united together, I begin to see that, and it allows me to connect with it rather than divide over our limited understanding or our wrong ideas or beliefs that we differ on. I can unify on the truth and the reality that you are in God, that, that God has his hand on you, and so that the work of God that, he, that he's developing, I begin to see, and I begin to revere the power of God and worship him and, and unite, and it brings love for you. It brings respect and love for the hand of God. And I don't want to ever put that down. I do not want to look at somebody and say, well, they don't agree with me here. So therefore they're not spiritual. God is not developing them. They don't even know God. Well, I do believe that the more I get closer to him, the more he reveals himself and the more truth that I have. And so I, you know, obviously I, I have, especially if you've listened to me talk, I have placed a lot of value on understanding and teaching and, and, discerning the truth and studying and coming to knowledge and understanding of who God is. I place a lot of value in that, but I will never place that value above the hand of God. I want to have a humility to recognize the hand of God in any situation with any person, with any individual who is going through any type of, of transformation by the hand of God. I have to see it. I want to see it. Those are the things that I'm looking for. That is way more exciting to me than having all of my things figured out or fellowshipping with people who I agree with. Now, this is, this is another aspect of it. Just because I'm with people who agree with me doctrinally does not mean that I will have more unity. Let me say that again. Just because I'm fellowshipping with people who I agree with more doctrinally does not mean that I will have more unity with them. Because my unity does not come through the conformity of doctrine. Let me say that again. My unity with other people, with believers in Christ, does not come through conformity of doctrine. Now, I know that that's a lot. There's a lot there. And people say, well, how can you be, have unity with somebody who doesn't, who doesn't believe things that are very vital and very true? I'm not going there. That's not what I'm talking about. The, obviously, we have to accept the vital truth of God. That's not my point at all. My point is that if somebody's not hungry for God, if somebody is not seeking after God, but in their mind, they agree with the same doctrines that I agree with, the same belief system, the same understanding of the scripture. They agree with, with so much of the different things that I believe, but they're not living with a heart after God. And their life is, is not um, being activated by the presence of God. It's not being moved forward with the reality of the current presence, the current conviction, the cur current um, inspiration of God then 
I won't have unity with that. I, w- I just won't. Not, that's a choice, but it's also, it's just something that can't happen. So if I meet somebody who is who does have that, who is stirred by the vibrant, alive reality of God, but they come from a very different background and they don't understand and don't agree with some of the things that I believe and the, the things that, I, that I've studied that are very real to my heart, I will have more unity with that person because they have a fire, they have a passion and a desire to, and a hunger for God. I will have much more unity than I will with someone who doesn't. And that is something that I, I believe is very, very important for us to get a hold of and recognize that when we see people who are hungry for God, let's not worry about these things. Let's not worry about whether or not they've got it all figured out that their doctrines are all right. That has never been the heart of God. This is something that the church has fallen prey to for thousands of years now, is that unless you have these things figured out already, then you can't come into the presence of God, and we have to guard ourselves. We have to protect the church. We have to protect God from the fallacy, from the ideas. That that's, God himself will protect his church. Our job is to operate and do the things that God has said. God never said, go around and police thought. Go around and... and don't worship him. Don't don't worship God. Don't get into the presence of God. Don't don't unless you know what the person believes. That's foolishness. It can't happen. And even if they say what they believe, they may not truly believe it in their heart. So they're not having this honest, this sincerity anyway. And so you can't even police that. You have no idea. So God is not about this. It's not about operating in fear. This is something that comes in. And this idea that you have to wait until the doctrinal understanding or the lyric, especially when we're talking about the in, in this times of worship, God does not want us to sit there and be examining the lyrical content on a level that distracts and takes away from our affection, our desire, and our expression to God for who he is and loving on him that unites us together. Like I said, I'm not trying to say if the lyrics are are very, very off, which I have not, I've yet to see every single song that I've examined. I know people, you know, another song that comes up is, is reckless love. People talk, well, God's love isn't reckless. God, there's nothing about God that is reckless that, but the truth is the definition of the word is very simple to not give concern to one's own safety. That's the definition of reckless. And Jesus wasn't concerned about his own physical safety. He died on a cross. That seems pretty reckless to me, which is just a silly thing that people want to argue and get caught up in instead of recognizing, hey, no, we're singing about the beauty of, of Jesus, the way he, he pursued us, the way that he um, showed us the, the principle of leaving the 99 who are safe and secure and going and finding the one that's lost. We're singing about that. We're not, we're not supposed to get caught up in this, oh, that word wasn't, that the Bible doesn't say he was reckless. Well, it doesn't matter. It describes recklessness in what it says, just because it doesn't use the word. Because I don't want to get caught up in the lyrical content of every song. But that's another one that, that gets brought up again and again, honestly, for way too long now. I'm, I'm really get tired of the silliness that people get caught up in. And it really, because it really is. That is what Satan wants to do. He wants us to get bogged down in the silliness of getting worried and concerned about these lyrics instead of really connecting with who God is. And so... It, to be sensitive, like I said, I'm not trying to attack anybody. I'm just trying to to open our eyes to something that we can easily get caught up in that is not from God. It is not the power of God. Um, but if you're worried about this, if you really are, if this is something that you're dealing with that you're concerned about, it's because you've been influenced by a false spirit, a false religious spirit, I should say. You've been influenced by that. And uh, you know, maybe maybe a teacher, maybe a pastor talked about this. Maybe somebody you respect brought it up. Maybe you heard it on another podcast, and and it seemed real because they expressed all these different things about that that they talk about. But it's all from a fear. It's not they they, they might even quote scriptures that that God gives warning about believing false things and getting caught up in in deception. They 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 might have quoted those scriptures because those things are real. The Bible does give us that warning, but it's not in the warning of the context of worship. It's in the context of indulging in sinful activity. That's that's what the context of those warnings are. And we have to recognize and not sort of pull something out of Scripture and apply it to something that doesn't, doesn't work. You've been influenced by that, that false religious spirit. Um, or worse, now take this to heart. Think about this. If you, this is something that truly concerns you and you're really caught up in this, um, 
examine your heart. Um, it might be that you actually don't know the Father's heart. Let me say that again to be to be clear. You this might be an area that you have not grown intimate with our Father. You don't understand His heart towards you, and so out of fear, out of thinking that maybe you have messed up, maybe you misunderstood, maybe you sang a song the wrong way and that unleashed demonic power in your life or deception into your heart. If you are operating in that place of fear, that is not knowing God. God is not like that. When you understand his love, you do not have that kind of fear. All that fear is cast out. So the intimacy of knowing him, to be close to him, to be desiring him, you do not have to worry. And so if this is something that is consuming you, that you really are afraid that that you have or that the church or us as individuals are going to somehow mess this up or that, that it really is, that we are actually allowing evil things to, to be present in our worship is, is it comes from that fear. It comes from a place of not knowing God, not knowing our father's heart. And I, I really encourage you to examine that, to really examine whether, whether or not that is, has a reality because maybe you never have, maybe you've lost it. But please examine your heart on that because if if you really are afraid, like I said, most of the time this is just because you've been influenced. You've just heard somebody who has put together a good explanation of how this happens and that, and so you've been convinced. And so that if you're in that category of being convinced, yes, you need to have your eyes open to how wrongly those scriptures were used, you know, about deception and all these other things and how they're out of place. But if you really are dealing with this personally, and I would say, just go before God. Let him teach you because you will find that there really is nothing to be afraid of. When you're in the presence of God, when you're seeking after God, you will not get a stone. You will not be deceived. You will not be put into this place of, of receiving demons when you are trying to draw near to our Father and and the power of the cross of Jesus, you are not going to be um, in a vulnerable, dangerous place. You're, that is the safest. That is the most powerful place that you can be as an individual in pursuit of God. And, but say, that's why Satan wants to come in and undermine this. He wants to steal that away from you. And um, because his heart has always been that he will draw near to you when you reach out to him. He, when he sees you reaching out, he comes. He's not going to say, well, you were really close. Um, you almost had it figured out. You almost got your worship right, but you sang this lyric wrong, so I'm not going to come. I'm not going to be there for you. In fact, you just invited a demon in, and you're going to be controlled and influenced, and it's going to destroy you and your church. No, <laughs> no. If you actually know God, you know that this is not his heart. This is not how he operates. And so, you know, there's, there's so many different verses that come into my mind, but that's, that's the simplest one. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Don't, don't be living in fear that somehow if you draw near to him, you're going to struggle. You're going to create this opportunity for Satan to control you. Yes. Like I said, there are many pitfalls, even in the, in the truth in, in, in going to God. Yes. There's, there's other ways that he tries to undermine our worship, but this, this mindset has just been on my heart. It's been in my mind that. We have to dispel it. It's it's just another silly way that keeps us from developing deeper and more real experiences that can spring us forward, that grow us up in Christ. And so that that's, to me, that's what the Father's heart is all about. It's all about grace, the power, the power of God in our life to transform us, to give us the power over our weakness over our struggles, to inspire us, to get us closer to God, to to pull us close when we were far away, when, when our hearts are sinful, we repent. He shows us this complete compassion and this love and that the grace of God is just about giving us that, that access to him that we don't deserve. 
And so why would we think that we earn this through the way that we worship, through the way that we um, understand things? God, God's never about us having the right that we've earned to be in his presence. He gives that by his love. And so the only right that we have is the blood of Christ, the forgiveness of Christ that comes through his sacrifice, that we have this right to be intimate with him. And so let's, let's, let's indulge, let's give our hearts, let's, let's stir our hearts in love and desire and passion for God and not be held back by fears that somehow we would be doing the opposite. How can you do the opposite? Like I said, how? How can you do the opposite? If your heart is for God, how could you be worshiping Satan? It's not. It's just not true. It's not something to be afraid of. This is religious spirit. This is not knowing God that brings that type of fear into the, the things of God to undermine one of the most powerful things that can be in your life is to connect with God. It should be in your life. It must be in your life to connect with God, to receive the authority and the power and the anointing from God in his prophetic moments of worship to speak the reality so that we have this a live relationship and current word of God being spoken to us, his people. Well, that's that's what I've got today. I, I hope that this kind of, if you've been a part of this, if you've been thinking along those lines or you've heard other people, maybe you've questioned it because you've heard some things being said along those lines, I hope this helps you dispel that and really more than dispel it, really get into the power of what praising God and giving him all of our hearts and not being held back by any of these questions and fears in those moments, but yes, but actually stepping in, dive in all the way, be completely submerged in the presence of God so that, that we will come out clean, refreshed, empowered, excited, and able to conquer the, the obstacles in front of us. I hope this blesses you. I hope that you really, um, experience the, uh, the presence of God today through this, through thinking about this, because that comes in all the time. I'll be thinking about something and I'll break past a lie. And the presence of God is like, yes, 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 I'm here. And I get to celebrate that. So I hope that this does that for you right now. And I hope that you just have a great day and are filled with the presence of God. Amen. But we will be the ones to see it through. And everything lost will be renewed. Long ago in the garden it was to be. Now a dream fulfilled in you and me. Whoa, oh